Good to go. I'm ready to move. All right. So we're right at 12. So. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the Museum of the Albemarle for today's History for Lunch program, both here in person as well as virtually on Zoom. Uh, we just ask that those of you all who are Zooming in, if you could just uh, mute uh, your microphone. And then if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat and we'll have time for all of our questions, both in person and virtually at the end of the program. Now, just a reminder that the next History for Lunch is scheduled for Wednesday, October 19th at 12. Uh, we're going to feature author and historian Michael C. Hardy, who's going to provide more information through his book on epithets and other tales from the Outer Banks, the mountains, uh, and all the places in between. Uh, he's going to tell North Carolina history by exploring all the sites, the monuments, museums, and public spaces that have shaped the state. And you can find Mr. Hardy's book, A History Lover's Guide to North Carolina, in the museum gift shop. Now today we welcome author Laverne Davis Parker. Uh, she will provide the history of the Creef Davis family and their boats, uh, the skills and traditions of boat builders, George Washington Creef Sr., George Washington Creef Jr., Ralph Davis, Vern Davis, <clears throat> and Buddy Davis will be the highlights of the talk, which are also revealed in her book that I'll have pictures throughout. Uh, Ms. Parker's book, Our Family, Its History, Their Boats, Six Generations of Boat Builders in Dare County, uh, can be purchased in the museum gift shop today and there'll be a uh, book signing after our program so we'll go ahead and welcome miss parker for today's presentation thank you okay thank you no <clears throat> thank you my name is laverne davis parker as noah just said uh, i come from a history of boat builders at least six generations of them that i know of so hopefully my presentation will live up to their long lived boats. Um, I thank the Museum of the Albemarle and I thank you for coming today as well as those of you that are attending on Zoom. And looking at my book, Our Family, Its History, Their Boats, it is my first attempt at writing a book. Um, so far, I'm getting pretty positive results from it. So much so that I'm attempting at the present time to write another book. Once again, on my hometown of Mateo. The second book will be on Mateo Boat Building Company during World War II. But this particular book, Our Family, if I sh can shorten it for that, is uh, the result of many questions that have been asked by family. I guess since I'm the matriarch of the family now, since I am also uh, a history major and a retired teacher, they think that I'm supposed to know all of this history. But the research has been uh, very interesting to me, uh, both with my Cree family and with my Davis family as well. Um, our family, like so many other families in this country today, have kind of spread far and wide from our roots. Some of the time the migration um, could possibly have been forced, but most of the time the migration was a voluntary migration. They left because they wanted a better life. They wanted a chance for a better education. Or maybe they even married someone who moved from the Outer Banks of North Carolina. But wherever they went, they created their own lives. They created their own ways. And then um, as they aged and the people that they were related to on Roanoke Island began to die, then they had a desire to find out more about their roots, more about where their family came from, more about what their old family did. If I look at myself, I too moved away, but then in a reverse migration, 
I moved back to Matteo. I ended up marrying a former classmate and we raised our family in Kill Devil Hills. I'd always thought about writing a book about my family, particularly my father and my uncle's race boats, because these are the boats that I grew up hearing about or that I grew up riding around in. But once I retired from the College of the Albemarle, I guess that's been almost 12 years ago, I decided that maybe it was time to organize my dad's notes. My dad had died four years prior to my retirement. And once I started organizing the materials, and believe me, it was an organization because my dad's concept of filing materials was putting everything in one box. No organization at all to it. But once the materials were organized, this led me to reach out to the boat racing community that he and my uncle had loved so much. Their family responsible or their family's responses were phenomenal. It was almost like opening a floodgate. Photographs, trophies, scrapbooks, anything that they had on their family, racing histories and, story, and stories were shared. Even one gentleman said to me, I will copy my father's scrapbook and I'll send it to you. So a year later, I got the scrapbook, but it wasn't a copied scrapbook. It was the original scrapbook. Now I've been talking to this gentleman on the phone or by email for a couple of years. Basically he had no idea who I was other than the daughter of the father that built his father's boat. So trying to gather the materials I thought was gonna be difficult. It turned out being overwhelming. I also expanded the coverage of the family in the book because I realized early on the effect of the now famed George Washington Creefs, plural, because there's still some people in Dare County who think there was only one George Washington Creef, but there were two, at least two in my family. So it wasn't just the DNA. It was the love for boats that they obtained from the two creeps. They weren't really interested in the utilitarian work boats of the creeps, but my father and my uncle were more interested in developing boats for speed. In the late 1930s, Ralph, my uncle, was called the Speed King. And then later, around the turn of the 21st century, my father became called the master of going faster, something that he was pretty proud of in his mid eighties. This photograph is a photograph of the Creef and Creef Railways in downtown Mateo. George Washington Creef's two sons, George Washington Jr. and Benjamin Howard built a marine railway on the south end of town in the late 1890s. The railways remained in the same location and the property remained in the same family until 1984 with the launching of the Elizabeth II. And then when Mandio decided to do its restoration project downtown, the Creef and Davis families donated the land on the waterfront to the town to use as a boathouse 
always has a working boathouse and a park. And of course now using the term lightly, the Roanoke Island Maritime Museum. Um, in looking at this railways, there is on the waterfront in Mandio today, a bridge. That bridge on the waterfront is the location of the original Creef waterway. George Washington Creef Sr. was born in East Lake in 1829. And for those of you not familiar with Northeastern North Carolina, East Lake is on Dare County's mainland. He moved to Manteo sometime either before or after the Civil War. If I looked at, say, just a deposition that was given to the United States government in 1877, when he was trying to help his friend George Bliven uh, get back some land that had been taken from, uh, from him during the Civil War. He said in this deposition that he gave that he was a ship's carpenter. He was 28 years old, whoops, pardon me, 48 years old. I'm trying to make him too young. But as Davis has increased, we'd like to stay too young. Um, he stated that during the Civil War, he was always loyal to the United States and had been employed by the United States Navy to freight coal in his own vessel. He also said that he lived on Roanoke Island during the Civil War and also at the time of the deposition. He, like so many others, had to find new ways of moving forward with their lives after the Civil War. Perhaps during the Civil War, hauling back coal for the Navy, he saw a need for a boat that could maneuver the shallow waters and sounds of Northeast North Carolina. So he developed a new boat design. Michael B. Alford, in his book, Traditional Work Boats of North Carolina, said that George Washington Creef gave his boats graceful curving frames from the spreading roots of the white cedar tree. The mid body, he said, was wide to carry large loads of fish. The ends were lean and fine to easily ride the big seas near the inlets. Sails were used to power the boats, a sprit, a mainsail, and a triangular jib. They also from time to time were able to use a flying jib. Two men were needed to operate this new design of boats, one to steer, and one to shift the ballast. According to my dad, um, the ballast that was used would often weigh, was put into bags and it often weighed 50 pounds or more. So I would think it had to be um, a pretty heavy industrious man in order to do this, moving on the seas at the same time. His newly designed boat was eventually called a shad boat. And in 1987, thanks to the hard work of Earl Willis Jr. and Mark Bass Knight, the shad boat was adopted as the official state historic boat of North Carolina. Several of Creef's shad boats remain today for you to see. But you need to remember when you view them that they were work boats and that over the years they have gone through many changes.
this is one of the shad boats. This is the foul play. She was probably built as a sister boat to the Tom Dixon. The Tom Dixon was once owned by Earl Willis Jr. and his family. George Washington Creef Sr. liked to build two boats at a time. And the approximate building dates of the Tom Dixon and the foul play are 1882 to 1887. The Tom Dixon hopefully will soon be restored. She today resides at the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort and they recently have received a grant which should allow her to be preserved. The foul play was restored by the Maritime Museum in Beaufort and today she resides at the Roanoke Island Festival Park in Matteo. This photograph was taken with the added camera or I'm sorry with the added cabin and this cabin was removed in its restoration. There was a, an Oregon Inlet wreck report that I found that was dated October 30th, 1889, and it gave support for the age of the foul play. It said that she was 12 years old, she was from Roanoke Island, and her owner was William St. Clair Pugh from Wanchies. Mr. Pugh, in reading about him, was a, a merchant and a fisherman. So he kept the boat within his family until 1964. And in 1964, this boat was purchased by Joe Meekins of Wanchies, and he and his family used the boat until she was transferred back to the family, the Cree family in 1987. There was a letter from one of Pew's relatives that was written to Joseph Meekins in 1962. It said, she was the safest boat operated out of Oregon Inlet, made so by the shape of her stern and tuck. She settled down at the stern and she runs the breakers safely in her own way. He went on to say in this letter that their shad boats were unique. Lime white sails, centerboard down, sandbagged ballast piled on the windward washboard. They would look at the wind square in the eye and make headway landward. <coughs> this is a, a picture, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> of the foul play in, in Mario today. <coughs> I'm sorry, but I'm just getting over a cold. This is the <clears throat> Ella View, another shad boat that was restored in Mystic, Connecticut. She was built between 1883 and 1894, depending on who you talk to. She was named after my grandmother, Ella Creef, who was born in 1881. And at that time, George Washington Creef Sr. was 52 and his son, George Washington Jr. was 25. 
Family lore has said that both of the Creefs named their boats after family members. So Ella was the granddaughter of George Washington Sr. and the first child of George Washington Jr. There's really no definitive proof that only George Washington Sr. built her by himself as by this time he was beginning to pass on his skills and his knowledge of boat building, not only to his sons, but also to his neighbors, particularly the Otis Doe family on Roanoke Island. Mr. Otis Doe had five sons and all five of the sons built shad boats. And the design was also being looked at and copied different places throughout Eastern North Carolina. From the boat's construction until 1964, the Ella View was owned and used by Josephus Berry and his family. In 1964, the boat was acquired by Mystic Seaport Museum in Mystic, Connecticut. And this photograph is a picture of the Ella View as she had been restored in Mystic, Connecticut. In 1974, she was traded to the Mariners Museum in Newport News, Virginia a move that put her a little bit closer to home. And this is where I first remember seeing her was at the Mariners Museum. From 1998 to 2017, the boat was on loan to the North Carolina Maritime Museum and the Roanoke Island Commission. This allowed the boat to return to Roanoke Island and be displayed closer to the George Washington Creef boathouse. And you can see in this photograph, the shed that she is in today. In 2017, the boat was given to the town of Mattio. And in 2018, the Maritime Museum in Beaufort painted and restored some places on her and then returned her to the shed once again in Mattio. So whenever you're in Mattio, you can read some of the materials that are on the Yellow View and you can see why she's so important to me. Another of the shad boats was the Paul Jones. The Paul Jones was fished commercially by Ira Spencer of Mans Harbor until 1979. And in 1979, she was sold to the Cree family. <coughs> If you look at the stern view of the Paul Jones, you can note the heart-shaped stern that George Washington Creef Sr. was so known for. This boat has not been restored. She now resides in a shed behind the family's Pioneer Theater in Matteo. It's my hope that before she is too far gone, she will be restored as another Creef boat for us to remember. This photograph is a tintype of George Washington Creef Jr. and his wife, Annie McLeese Baum. As I said earlier, he and his brother Benjamin Howard built boats together 
in downtown Mandio. Kreef Jr. is most well known for the building of the Sharpie Bug Eye Ella Kreef, or pardon me, my great aunt wouldn't like me saying that, Hattie Kreef. Um, the boat was converted many times for many different uses during the 70 years that she plied the waters of Northeast North Carolina. The book refers to both the boat and my great aunt Hattie as Renaissance women, able to change and reawaken with the times. From sail to engines, gas engines and later diesel engines, she was always changing and reinventing herself for many uses. Fish boat, freighter, sailboat, oyster boat, uh, recreational vehicle while she lived here in Elizabeth City for a while, um, anything she would reinvent herself for. This is the Hattie Creef, once again, named after my great aunt. And it was a drawing by my uncle Ralph Davis. The boat was probably um, just under 65 feet in length because that enabled the builders to escape from the stricter qualifications which were applied to boats by the old steamboat service. She was over 18 feet wide. She had a shallow draft of four feet and white cedar was used throughout. Another drawing by Ralph Davis shows the Hattie Creef as a freighter and motorized. The Hattie Creef's claim to fame was between 1903 and 1911. When from Elizabeth City, she took two young brothers and their crates with their glider and airplane parts to Kitty Hawk. The Hattie Creef was more than a boat to many people in Northeast North Carolina. She was uh, more like an old friend more like a family member. And whenever you talk to them, no matter what story they tell you, older people will say that whatever her job was, she did it and she did it well. This photograph is of my uncle Ralph. He's picked pictured in the kind of cream colored sweater vest and of my father in the vest and tie, Vernon Davis. As young boys, their great grandfather died in 1917 and their grandfather, George Washington Creek Jr. died in 1928. Most of their lives, their great grandfather's shad boats were around for them to learn from. They spent a lot of time around their grandfather and particularly around a race boat that he built called the Dodger. The Dodger raced with several other boats in the late teens and the 1920s, um, all throughout Northeastern North Carolina. The boats from home were called uh, the Miss Ford, the Miss Chevrolet, and uh, then the Dodger, of course. Vernon in particular followed in the footsteps of both of the creeps. He liked to get up early, most of the time before dawn, and he would go to the boathouse and get out his tools and be ready to work at first light. And this is a story that's told by the Creef family as well, of both George Washington Creef Sr. And, and Jr. 
in 1906, he married uh, Annie Kreef. I better get this right. This is my family. I can tell I don't feel good. Um, the brother's mother was Ella Kreef, and she was the oldest child of George Washington Kreef Jr. and Annie McLeese Baum. In 1906, she married Carson W. Davis. Carson was originally from Perquimans County and did spend a, a short part of his life here in Pasquotank. Carson was a merchant in Mattia. And from what dad told me, his mom pretty much raised and spoiled the two sons and their sister, Annie. But as was common in the 1920s in the South, the boys were sent away to military school after graduating from high school in Mattia. Maybe it was to get some of the sand from between their toes, but more than likely it was to teach them some discipline and responsibility. Ralph went to Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia, and he loved it. My dad, Vernon, was sent to Riverside Military Academy in Gainesville, Georgia, and he hated every minute that he was there. But I will have to say that later in life, he did see the value of what he learned at Riverside. By the time the brothers came home in 1929, 1930, the country was in the Great Depression. Vernon very quickly married and had a child. And with that responsibility, he, excuse me, he began to work in the family store as did his brother, Ralph. Carson, their father, always felt that the store was the way to make a living. Daddy and Uncle Buddy always felt that the store was a way of getting spending money for their first true love, which was boats. Growing up in the house next to the two brothers was their lifelong friend, Cora May Bassnight. In her book, Memories of Mattio, she wrote about the Davis brothers. She said, they owned a boat building business at one time, but they started out building those boats when they were just boys. One day she said, they took the works out of an old clock, put the motor in a boat they had, and they ran it up and down the ditches in front of our houses. There were several attempts at boats that did not turn out the way the brothers wanted. But once home, there seemed to be an urgency to build boats that would really run with speed. Maybe they were influenced by their uncle Herbert Grief, who raced a Ventnor built race boat, in fact, two of them, one called the Miss Mantio, the other called the Miss Mantio II. Um, these were boats that were designed by uh, Adolf and Arno Appel, and they were three point hydros. In 1936, the Miss Mantio II blew the trophies out of the water in her class. She was a very successful boat. She was not built by the Cree families, but she was raised by the Cree families. Uncle Hub, if I might call him that, Herbert Cree was much more interested in the engines in the boats than he was in the actual building of the boats himself. In the 1930s, the brothers, built three boats named for my older sister, Pat. Each one has its own special story, but the most successful was the Pat II. The Pat II 
was a class E service runabout and was launched into her first race in Mandio in 1937. The class E was based on cubic inches, 255, length 16 feet, eight inches, and weight 1,250 pounds. The class was very popular on the East Coast between the 1930s and the 1960s. And then in Louisiana and a few other spots like Southern Florida, they were also important through the early 70s. Ralph and Vernon were known for the non-trip chines on the bottoms of all their race boats. This would give the boat stability and it would also give the boat lift. This was something that they had learned from their grandfather and they had developed this and perfected it from his early attempts at it. Rarely did one of their boats ever flip in a race. The Pat II was built in the garage, the barn, and the backyard of the Davis house in Matteo. The book has a lot of information about how she was built, how many hours it took to build her, what materials were used, um, even the color of the boat is described. She was raced by the brothers throughout most of 1939. And in 1939, after Uncle Buddy had hit a piece of wood when he was racing in the President's Cup Regatta and the Pat II sunk, when they brought her home, her engine had to be rebuilt. So he took the engine to uh, Uncle Hub's workshop on the south end of Matteo, and in 1939, with a terrible infamous fire there, it was destroyed in the workshop. So this brought an end to the Pat II. It meant that the brothers were out of money and they decided to sell her while she was still rent winning. So they sold her to George Brickerhoff of College Park, Maryland. He changed her name to the Monk and she continued her winning ways through 1941. And in 1941, uh, boat racing stopped all over this country until World War II was over in 1945. After World War II, she raced and she won many times, but as she began to lose to newer boats with better technology, dad and uncle buddy purchased her and brought her back to Mattia. They didn't like the idea that she was losing races. She was placed in the back of the boat shop and in a storm in the early 50s, she washed out of the building. They looked for her, but they couldn't find her anywhere. And about 30 years later, Vernon and his wife, Lassie, were down on Hatteras Island to have lunch with some friends. And there was the Pat II on the side of the road for $75. She had been converted into a hunting and fishing boat. And you know what happened. He purchased her and he brought her home again. He started the restoration of the Pat II, but the death of Ralph and the death of his wife, along with his own health problems, as well as other outside boating interests that I'll show you in a few minutes, he left her unfinished. And then after he died, she got away from the family. And today she resides just as she was in a shed at the Maritime Museum in Beaufort.
and I'm sorry for the quality of, of this photograph. As I researched the Class E's that the brothers built, which are left today, I began to realize just how many trophies, first place championships in the APBA, high point winners in the APBA were accumulated. It wasn't just local championships. It wasn't just national championships. It was also international championships. They also had these wins in inboards, such as the Class E service runabouts, in outboards, such as um, Charles McNaughton raced here in Elizabeth City. And then also the last boat, which my father built, which I will show you shortly, uh, also held championships in hydroplates. Dad and Ralph, when building boats, were always looking for a more cutting edge. And these boats were built for the everyday man, the weekend racer, the one who wanted a fast boat that he could go out and race on Saturday or Sunday, and then he could go home Monday morning and hopefully go to work and get on with his life. They were expensive during their time period, but not by any means with what's going on in racing today, which is pretty prohibitive for the everyday ordinary man. Each of the boats that still live on, as well as those that we have no idea what's happened to, seem to have their own personality. The Peggy, which you see here, was the first boat built after World War II in 1946-47 for Rondell Dowdy of Grandy, North Carolina. In 1948, she had over 20 first place wins and no losses in Class E's. And she raced up and down the East Coast, New Jersey to Florida. She broke for a time and held world's records in Class E's. Mr. Dowdy was inducted into the very prestigious Gulf Marine Hall of Fame. Between 1950 and 1951, for some reason which I've not really been able to find out. I mean, if I've heard a reason in Louisiana, I've heard two or three reasons in Mandio, but nobody can tell me exactly why she was sold. But she was sold to Mr. John Otis of New Orleans, Louisiana, and he changed her name to the Me Too question mark, or the Me Too. This is the Me Too as she raced in Louisiana Looks like a lot of fun, doesn't it? In 1952, the Me Too won in her class the world's record speed. And that world's record speed was 52.264 miles per hour. This beat the record the day before by the same boat of 51.282 miles per hour. Hour. The Me Too's driver was Bobby Bork, and Bobby Bork uh, was also inducted into the Gulf Marine Hall of Fame. Mr. Otis told Dad that he always wanted a boat that would scare him, and he loved the fact that she would turn on a dime and would give you a nickel and change. Today, she is owned by his godson. And hopefully, since he's just put a new bottom back on the boat, and he uses her frequently on the bayous in Louisiana, hopefully I'll be able to go for a ride in her in mid-November. The Raya, also a Class E service runabout. Whereas race boats usually have 
hard lives. You read about their broken frames, their bottoms having to be replaced, something always wrong with the motor. That is not the example with the riot. The riot has led a charmed life. In fact, in the book, I call her the princess. She's never raced in a sanctioned race, yet she does have some titles of her own because in Ottawa, Canada in 1987, she was voted the classic boat of the year. She was built for Boyd Halbison of Two Harbors, Minnesota. And in 1950, he had written a letter to my father and he said, can you build me a boat that will beat my neighbors? And so dad wrote back to him and said, yes, I think I can. So the riot was built. She was sent to uh, Minnesota. She beat the neighbor. Unsanctioned race, remember now, 62 miles an hour. And in fact, the Helgeson boys say that she was never beaten in any race on the lake. She was used by the family uh, until they got older. Then they sold the lake house and they sold the boat with the lake house. The boat was still used. It was eventually sold and resold and sold again, but always stored in a barn or in a boathouse of some time, kind where she was protected from the Minnesota winters. Eventually she was sold to the Lewis family of New York and Florida. And she was later restored by simply painting her once again, as you can see in this photograph and varnishing her decks and working some on the motor, but she has her original motor as well. They use the boat until she was sold to Dr. Bob Hampton, also of New York. And Bob was telling me in late December, she was sold back to one of the original restorers and she now lives in Florida. His plan is to use her until he no longer can. And then he wants to return her to Clayton, New York to their infamous antique boat museum. Once again, when she's returned, she will be protected for others to view. The Vaughn Francis was the most feared of class eight. She won in 1952 the Orange Bowl regular plaque of DEF runabouts. In 1953, she set the world's records for ease on the one mile straightaway, and she did the same thing in 1954. In 1955, she was a high point winner for the APBA. And for four consecutive years, her owner, Enoch Walker of Hampton, Virginia, was elected to the Gulf Marine Hall of Fame. No one knows what happened to this boat. Mr. Um, Walker moved to Florida. He retired in Florida and no one can find any record of her since 1962. The Rockaby was another Class E. She was built for Russ Kirkpatrick of Clarksburg, West Virginia in the early 1950s. And she was awarded over 50 awards or trophies in the six years that she raced. She's the only Davis boat which has uh, fins on the back side both sides. In 1994, she was bought and restored by Jim Hover of New York, 
and for a while he owned another Davis boat, but recently he sold it to someone in South Carolina for restoration. He still owns at this time the, the Rockabye. The Miss Beebe was a favorite boat that raced here in Elizabeth City. She was owned by Edgar Jones of Hampton, Virginia. And she was the last of the Davis E's to race on the East Coast. She often raced, as I said, in Elizabeth City, as did the other boats that I've shown you today. Edgar's son, Bob, is a gentleman who sent me his father's scrapbook to use in my project. He was telling me he recently has finished a smaller version of the Miss BB. And then he asked me last month if I have some statistics and sizes for the usual size of the Class E's, because now he's planning on building a full version of the Miss BB. The original Miss BB, like the Von Francis, has disappeared. The book describes other boats, not just Class <laughs> E's that Dad Let's and see. Uncle Buddy constructed. Between 1946 and 1960, they constructed 12 to 16 foot runabouts, family runabouts. These were sold up and down the East Coast. In the 1950s, many were souped up for speed and they were raced in Northeast North Carolina. Championships were also won with some of them. Vernon was thrown through the side of one of these in the late 50s. It was a, an experimental one. And she kind of had a mind of her own. This ended his racing career. And with their father, Carson, soon dying, the store finally won and the brothers ceased building boats, but never ceasing was their love of boats, which they passed on to other family members. This is the launching of a Buddy Davis boat. Ralph's son, Carson Ralph Buddy Davis, came into boat building after his dad and uncle had retired. So he learned his craft for building the Carolina Flare, Flare fishing boats from men such as Warren O'Neill, Omi Tillett, and Sheldon Midget. Mr. Warren was well aware of his boat building heritage and he nurtured Buddy and Buddy's skills. Buddy is not responsible for the Carolina Flare as far as the design is concerned, but he is responsible for spreading the sales of the Carolina Flare internationally. And just to show quickly looking at time that I can't get away from family, this photograph was taken in Slidell, Louisiana in, nine, or in 2019. Um, and it is a Buddy Davis boat sitting in the backyard of an old boat racer. Buddy's son, Wade, worked with his father. And after his dad's business was, was closed, he chose to restore the deep water for John Wilson in Matteo. This is the last boat that my father was involved in building. In the 1980s and 90s, he was part of a race team out of Hampton, Virginia and Salisbury, Maryland. They raced hydroplanes and he built a final boat with them named the Catch-22. The Catch-22 was definitely a step up from the type of boats that he had built earlier. It was an APBA champion in its class in 1994. And this is another photograph of it running just 
two years ago. So it's still on the water, but not driven by the original owner, Bobby Brown, but instead driven by his daughter, Lauren. As the Museum of the Albemarle's exhibit titled Rock of the Eye, Boat Building Traditions Around the Albemarle Opens, it will show you techniques that would have been very familiar to my father, my uncle, my great-great-grandfather, my great-grandfather. My dad once said in a letter in his files, remember in the game I play and with the players I play with, you have to be a dreamer. We see the complete boat step by step as quickly that vision is what we build from, sometimes without any drawings. Where do the ideas come from? Looking, thinking, studying the actions of boats and comparing them with the competition. With me, without any formal schooling and training in boat building, they come from the master builder. It is my belief that you were born with the ability to be a boat builder. These local histories of our area, not just of my family, but of other families as well, should not be forgotten. Their legacies have developed us into the people we are today. So a special museum of the Albemarle for keeping our local history alive. Um, thanks for coming. And um, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Noah, you have any questions? On Zoom. Not any on Zoom? Gosh. <laughs> yes. I have one question. You know, as we have the shed by hanging in the lobby, still by Elvira Creek, Elvira Wright, uh, is there any record in any of your research that mentions him working with the. Uh, <laughs> Not that I found. I think it's boats from what we have in our possession resemble the description you gave in the very early call. Right. I think that most of the shad boats, no matter who they were built by in, uh, in Northeastern North Carolina, pretty much had the same design, a few changes. Like I think the sterns of most of them are a little different. Uh, I've not noticed that much difference in my research on the bows of them, but I am by no means an authority on shad boats. If you want to talk to somebody who's an authority on shad boats, you need to talk to Earl Willis Jr. Uh, who was from Wanchese and now he lives in Edenton. He loves shad boats. I like race boats, they go faster. Yes. My question is on shad boats. What I have never been able to understand is how they use them for fishing because they had, I think was called a goose neck sail on the top. How they use them in those pound nets. Because from what I remember, the smaller one, the 23 foot and 24 foot was the one they used inside the net. Mm -hmm. How they were able to sail that boat inside the net fish. I, I've just never been able to find anybody to tell me anything about that. Well, Do you have any information on the sailing part of them? Uh, only what I've read and heard from other people. Um, as I said, I am by no means an authority on chat boat. Um, I, I've read that a lot of it was the maneuverability of the driver of the boat, if I'll call him that. 
Um, most of them were pretty skilled at what they did, but I can't go any farther than explaining that to you. Mickey Burns, this is Mickey Rickstotter. I always love hearing you share our favorite history and learn something new each time. We are sending you love from Wisconsin. And Michelle Ball uh, said she thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Okay, you're probably going to have to repeat that to me because I can't hear all of it. Okay. All right, I thank you for coming. Um, please come down to Manio and see the shad boats that are still there. And please come back and see this beautiful exhibit. I've had a sneak preview and you'll be greeted by my great, great grandfather at the door. So it'll be really worth seeing when it opens in just a couple of days, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, next week. Okay, next week, okay. Thanks again.